Okay, welcome to our final lecture in our Entrepreneur Leadership Series. This is number 10. Um, we have really enjoyed this. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Have you enjoyed the series this year? Let's hear it, if you've enjoyed the series. Okay. So uh, most of you know we do this every spring semester. We have an entrepreneur on campus every Wednesday. The class is just, you know, one credit, pass, fail. And you can take it four times. You can keep taking it as long as you're here. So we're working right now on our speakers for next year. And by September, we'll have all of them locked in. It's going to be another really great series. Uh, tonight, the Shark Tank Night has been managed by Russell Fisher. Russell is the associate director of the center. So I'm going to let him take it from here. And then we'll talk to you during the intermission while the judges are judging the pitches, OK? So here's Russell Fisher. That's right. I love it. Welcome to Shark Tank, the biggest event of the year. We're so excited to have you as a part of this event. I'm going to tell you how the night's going to go. We're going to, we have five great companies here. They made me write limericks because I did this last year for the judges, so I did it this year for the team. So you'll get to hear that, and that's why you're here, I know. But during the break, because these guys take forever, we'll introduce them in just a second, but they take forever to decide who wins this competition. We'll do, uh, we'll have a little video on seed, we'll talk about the minor, which I hope you're signing up for for the summer, and we'll also have a little pitch competition. So there'll be some papers that will be passed out right now. If you want to be a part of this pitch competition, take a piece of paper, you'll put an idea on the pitch, and we'll have you throw a uh, paper airplane at me. The four, the four people who pitch, who get closest to me, will get a Chick-fil-A gift certificate. So that will be cool, right? And we'll throw out some more swag later on. All right. So the way this works, we have five teams, like I talked about. They each have a business that they're either starting or they're running. And they'll have five minutes to present that. We have Amber Lee will be down here saying five, four, three, two, one. And then the judges will have three minutes of questions. They never follow this time, so it'll probably be four minutes of questions. And Amberly will try and get them to stop. All right, so here are our judges. Um, we'll start from, I was going to say from best to worst, but it's just kind of worst and then best here. So, uh, yeah, best to worst on the edges there. <laughs> All right, so we've got Fraser Roy. Fraser Roy, it, you should cheer for him. Okay. All right. Frazier Roy is from Workman Nidegger. He helps us out with a lot of legal help, helps students all the time, and he's an intellectual property lawyer. We have Teresa Foxley. She's from EDC Utah. Let's give her a big round of applause. <laughs> Teresa helps uh, businesses across the state to start and get going and also to get bigger. And so we, we're just really pleased to have her apartment. She is an Aggie, so we're excited to have her here. I see a lot of Aggies here. We have Danielle Nelson, Nielsen, who, did you speak last year? She spoke last year in this series. She founded Diamond Wireless and now is with the Protein Foundry. So let's give a round of applause. And then there's Ryan. He's on the end. Ryan, boo. Ryan's one of my best friends. Ryan is from Epic Ventures, uh, and he is also an Aggie. So we're happy to have him here. All right. Do we have Amberly in position? Get, you're the timekeeper. All right. So here's our four, five companies and my scratched out limericks that they asked me to do an hour ago. We have River Bottom Butterflies. Don't come out yet. We have Compost Cash Valley. Starling Co., Blue Bowl Rodeo Sauce, and Bio Experience. So here's your introduction. River Bottom Butterflies. Okay. To start the shark pitching cycle, we begin with a towering Michael, whose pro put in motion with sweetest devotion and started a butterfly cartel. All right. River Bottom Butterflies, come on up. Ladies and insects, uh, gentlemen, good evening. I'm Michael. And I'm Parker. And we're the founders of Riverbottom Butterflies. 
My brother is the CEO, but I'm the, CC, the CPPID, Chief Bug Boy in Charge. So we sell Coleman tents. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we don't want to bug the judges for very long. So we are going to show you what we do rather than tell you. So if you would step into our office really quickly here, please. So normally, you wouldn't release butterflies inside of a building. But we've tried to mimic a little bit of daylight here just to give you guys a little bit of experience uh, and a little visual on how this would look. This might be the first indoor butterfly release at USU of all time. And our first indoor one ever, so. So I'm just going to dump these out onto the plants. <laughs> so these are actually painted ladies. Uh, these white ones are called cabbage whites. Um, we also have monarchs. We'll get into a few more details as our presentation goes. Um, they won't bite, so if you can manage to catch one or have one land on your finger, go for it. Yeah. So this is an example of a mass release. Sometimes you can have 50, 100, 200, or uh, butterflies come in these little envelopes where you can actually pass them out to the crowd, pass them out to everyone at the birthday party, at the wedding. Um, where everyone can take, a, uh, take part in it and they can actually empty the butterfly out onto their hand and everyone can release it at the same time. So I'm going to give one of the judges the opportunity to do that. So. Open it up and You take that one. That's fine. So a lot of the times, they will just sit on your hand, they'll warm up in the sun, they'll show off to you a little bit, they might lick your finger, and then they'll fly away. It's a really big awe, and it's a really uh, big, fun sensation for everyone. I don't think they're coming out this way far. You can just do this. There you go. Show and tell's over. So. Okay. Alrighty. Alrighty. We've got like three minutes now. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> Go for it. So there are millions of weddings, birthday parties, and memorial services that happen every single year. And, and people are willing to spend hundreds and even thousands of dollars at these events. Bug, wait, there's more. Um, there are also thousands of flight houses, elementary schools, children's museums that are also uh, willing to take part in the wholesale market for uh, butterfly releases. Um, we want to make this, these the most memorable experiences of people's lifetime. Uh, that's why we founded River Bottom Butterflies. So we specialize in the breeding, growing, and shipping of butterflies across the U.S. Um, and for individual and also mass releases. We want to make this experience available for everyone. This started as a hobby business. And in just a few months, I was able to run over 14,000 in revenue on a 10-foot square shelf in my home. Uh, so once we was selling, we realized there was a big shortage, and we wanted to take a larger part in it. Here, hold this. So right now, we're investing in a clean room that can produce up to 2,400 butterflies every single week. That represents about $125,000 of revenue every single year. Um, the paint, that's for painted ladies. They cost about 22 cents to grow, and they sell for about 3 to $4 each. Um, there are others that we have that have even higher margins. If you go to the next slide. Uh, our next big step is Monarchs. Um, they cost less than a dollar to produce, and they, these beautiful butterflies retail for about $10 each. So why isn't everyone growing and breeding butterflies? Not everyone has the infrastructure in place of nine greenhouses and perhaps 11 acres of land ready to grow the food and the host plant that these caterpillars eat uh, that helps them form into the beautiful butterfly. Um, not everyone has years, a lifetime, and perhaps eight years uh, is what I have of, of uh, experience in the professional 
plant selling business, uh, growing healthy, strong plants year round. So I've also had the experience of going to USU where I've learned how to market, brand, and advertise products online while studying marketing and entrepreneurship at USU. Um, so essentially, he's got the, I've got the brains and he's got the bugs. Um, oh, sorry. This spring will become the exclusive provider of Painted Lady Butterflies for Thanksgiving Point and for Monarchs for Living Planet Aquarium. Each of these clients that we can gather represents five to $10,000 of revenue per year. I could be very well the only one in Utah right now with monarch eggs and with live monarch butterflies. Um, so uh, there are dozens of flight houses around the U.S. Um, and even close by uh, who are ready to knock down our doors as soon as numbers and populations rise, which is happening. So we're a little bit short on time, so we're going to move straight to Q&A. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. As someone that's seen thousands of pitches, this was awesome. I've never Thank held you. butterflies, so well done. Thank you. And I love the puns. Yes, those are my um, idea. So I've got to ask, what, so where, where do the butterflies go once you release them? They're just out into the wild, or you yeah, come so, back, and if so, how? Yeah, butterflies are natural pollinators. They're very good for the environment. Um, and actually, there's been a monarch shortage in the United States and Mexico for the last several years. And so... Breeding monarchs is a way to release more of them out into the wild. We're uh, stimulating the population. It does not have a negative effect on biodiversity. It has a very positive impact. Um, and they're just natural pollinators. So the only thing the caterpillars eat are weeds. So, so when, you, when you release them, though, do you get them back to re-rent them, or are they just gone? No, they're free. So is there any government restrictions to what you're trying to do? Is there anything going to limit you on being able to release those butterflies or growing the butterflies? Yeah, so the only restriction is shipping them across state lines. And we've already applied for permits to ship them to all 50 states. Um, the only restriction specifically is for monarchs. You can't ship them over the continental divide. That is the Rocky Mountains. And so a grower in Florida cannot ship to Utah or California. California can't ship to Nebraska or Vermont. Um, but for the rest of the butterflies, as long as we have the permits to ship across state lines, they just want to know that we're doing, and once we have those permits, we're good to go. So are you doing this on a family farm? Yes. So, so how are you going to transition this, or is the family farm going to convert to just raising butterflies? Uh, it already is. Um, in my nine greenhouses, I'm growing the food for them, I'm doing lots of experiments, uh, and a part of those uh, permits, I've already applied for them, and I received them all last December. Um, and actually having that government restriction of shipping across um, the Continental Divide helps this western side of the United States because there are very few breeders on this side, and so people are asking all the time, uh, you know, where can I get monarchs? Where can I get monarchs? So there is a huge shortage, and uh, the moment I have one ready, it will literally just sell. So... Also, real fast, our current capacity right now is, uh, if we were to max out our current capacity, that would reach about $600,000 in revenue in a worst case scenario per year. That's about 4,000 butterflies a week, uh, monarchs, not including painted ladies. So. Okay, so you said you have some current cells already, is that correct? Yes. Where are those coming from, your current cells so far? Right now, all of our current cells have been wholesale to uh, flight houses, Living Planet Aquarium, you know, children's museums. Um, they order them on a subscription basis every single week. So Living Planet Aquarium, Thanksgiving Point are our main. We're trying to break into retail, and that's why we've kind of looked at how lucrative birthday parties, weddings, memorial services. We think Memorial Day will be a huge day for us this year as something people could do instead of flowers to kind of remember their loved ones. And it's going to be the perfect time of year in the middle of summer. Okay, and then one last question. How are you going to market that to get those sales? Do you guys have a marketing plan in place to capture that market? Yes. Facebook ads and Google search ads. They're, they're very effective. I've used them before with other clients in my digital marketing experience. So. And just having a very quick, uh, a quick five second video or even a picture of butterfly release really captures the moment well. What does scale look like once you move outside of the family farm and do the economics still make sense if you're renting? Yeah, so one thing we've actually talked about recently is figuring out how to franchise or license this. Um, there's other markets that could serve this better than we could, and so we thought about charging like a licensing fee, they buy a starter kit, and then they can serve a local market better than we can. And if someone wants like a side hustle, then on weekends, they can actually go to birthday parties, set something like this up, 
do the release, talk about butterflies with the kids at a birthday party or at a school. Um, and so that would give us huge regional access as we uh, divvy out those divisions in the U.S. How long does it take to grow? Sorry. Did you hear that? <clears throat> How long does it take to get, grow a butterfly from caterpillar to So to starting, starting from an egg, a general rule is about a month to an adult butterfly. Okay, so you've talked about franchising or doing licensing. Have you done any branding investigation? Have you looked at getting a trademark registered either federally or at the state level? We're going to now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, how about that? All right, we'll help take this down. And, and then our next one coming up, after I get this, we'll introduce them. All right, so here's your next limerick of the night. What'd you guys think of that? Was that pretty cool? You heard about that before. Yeah. Okay, we now go with a product which in each of us could, should consider to pitch in. Now each of us rally for Compost Cash Valley, who started with worms in their kitchen. Compost Cash Valley. Hi, I'm Anthony Whaley. And I'm Rachel Bernardo. Today we're going to tell you the story about food waste in America. I know that sounds sexy, right? All right, so picture your favorite food in your head. You got it? All right, Anthony's just so happens to be burritos. Can't eat it anymore because we eat it so much. All right, now picture all of the time and the resources that went into every single ingredient that made this burrito or your favorite food that you're thinking of. Now imagine holding that plate and dumping a third of it in the trash. And that's exactly what happens. So about one third or 31% of all of our food that's produced ends up in landfills. And what happens to that food waste? Well, it clogs up our landfills, minimizes the lifetime that they can actually operate, it reduces our access to those nutrients for future generations, and it negatively impacts climate change. But let's break this down for you. So if you look at the top, one pound of food waste that we can divert from landfills is almost two pounds of carbon dioxide equivalents that could go into the atmosphere. If you wanna know more about that, I'd love to talk to you later. All right, so for example, each week our household, we live with other people too, produces five and a half pounds of food. Now that's around 286 pounds of food waste a year. That's a lot. And that 286 pounds just for one household is the equivalent of reducing your annual mileage by 2,200 miles so that you don't emit that much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Or the alternative is that you could plant 15 trees this year, grow them for 10 years, but each year you actually have to replant those 15 trees. So you're going to be actively watering and fertilizing those trees over their lifespan. So that sounds like a lot more work than simply separating out your food waste. So why we're here today, Anthony and I in front of you, we actually moved here from Ohio to Utah for Anthony to study in graduate school. Of course, he's a soil scientist. So, of course, when I'm cooking in the kitchen and realize that I have a lot of food scraps and don't know what to do with it anymore, because in Ohio we had a backyard where we could compost on our own, but there was also a compost company over in Dayton, Ohio. But in Logan, Utah, there was actually nothing that existed. So Anthony, of course, decided, let's bring worms into the apartment. And of course, being his lovely wife, I agreed. And we realize that not everyone is up for having worms in their place of living. 
And <laughs> because there's a few things. So not everyone has the time to actually build out that infrastructure. They may not even have the knowledge to know how to do it appropriately. And they just may not have the space to, to actually do this. And that's where Compost Cache Valley comes in. So we actually do all the dirty work of composting for you. And the way we do that is all of our customers will receive green bins. And it's like a curbside service. So you would throw your food scraps in, we would collect it, um, and then we'd throw it in with our worms. Now they're the ones that do the real dirty work for us. And then to close this whole loop on food waste, we actually will return uh, the food waste back to our customers in the form of vermicompost. Now, Anthony, of course, wanted to show you what our vermicompost looks like. And as you can see, it actually doesn't smell like Food waste, it's pretty good. It has a lot of nutrients in it. <laughs> yeah. But but what does this look like in terms of a residential food waste collection market in Cache County? So we're looking at forty one thousand households, that's about a million dollars in annual uh, sales right there. That would be all households would subscribe to our service. Um, but if we apply this to the whole, all households in Utah, we're looking at $16 million, or if we extrapolate it to the whole U.S., it's nearly $3 billion. So our current model right now is solely focused on residential. That's where those numbers came from. And our residential services are every other week to weekly services, and due to customer and community feedback, we actually added on glass services, since that's not an option here in Cache Valley. And with additional investment, we're not looking just to, to work with households. We're actually looking to move into office spaces, food industry partners like coffee shops and restaurants, as well as grocery stores, making events just like this one actually waste-free. And we can actually produce a product. So we have the vermicompost that we can sell by the pound. And just like butterflies, there is a large market for wor purchasing worms by the pound for local gardeners that are looking to use that for. Yeah, you'd be surprised. I was. But anyway, we want to have these additional services so that, and continue expanding so that we can minimize the impact on climate change for future generations by making composting convenient and easy for our community. Thank you. Um, I love the mission. I have a toddler, so I throw away a lot of food at the end of the day, and I would love the convenience of having it be a subscription at home service. Um, question would be around, um, have you thought about government channels? So I live in a community that actually does do composting. Would you partner with government and go through procurement processes? Yeah, that's what one of the avenues that we're looking for. Um, so as we expand to um, basically make an impact on a larger scale. One, it is directly in our mission, um, but two, it makes more financial sense to have the larger scales and single producers that actually make more food waste, like a municipal scale or a grocery store. So is there a limitation on how much compost you can get back based upon how much food waste you give? Yeah, so, um, yeah. so people are going to give us food waste. Um, we mix that food waste with carbon-based materials like cardboard, shredded paper, um, tree leaves um, that are shredded. And as the process, currently we use worms, so vermicompo vermicomposting process, that will produce about 25% of what we actually put in there. So some of it does volatilize um, just through different pathways. Yeah. Is your process proprietary then? Not currently, but we do have our environmental permits. If you were to receive funds tonight, what would you guys want to do with that money uh, to grow the business or scale, or what, what would you be looking to do with that? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's two things. Um, the first is that we named ourselves Compost Cash Valley. Um, compost as an action, so you're actively composting your food waste. Um, to Cash Valley because it's a locality, so it's a local solution for a global problem. But what we're looking to do is move into different markets. So you can think of Compost SLC, Compost Ogden, Compost Provo. Um, but to do that, we have to build out the infrastructure. So right now, we have the infrastructure to deal with a limited amount of uh, food waste coming in and processing that. And as we go forward, we need to build out a larger <laughs> infrastructure that can actually accommodate uh, a grocery store or a community-sized um, food waste. Yeah. Yeah. 
So Utah State's not going to have me back after I say this, but, <clears throat> but I spent my time in the psychology department in aviation, so don't hold that against me. What, what's the benefit? What would I, who wants to use this? I'm not, I don't grow anything. My wife has our garden. So what, who, what is the benefit of this soil? Yeah, so if you use a, uh, worms to, to process your compost, um, what you have is less leaching because we do it indoors and that returns a higher quality fertilizer, meaning that it has higher nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium than a normal compost would. So you can actually use about three times less uh, compost, vermicompost compared to a normal fer but, fertilizer. But really someone that's growing a garden wants this, is that right? Someone who's or growing a garden, uh, we use it in potted plants because we are in an apartment oh, space right okay. now. Um, so it's really easy to just use a couple pounds of it, spread it across your, your potted plants um, a few times a year. So you yeah. mix this with, with your other soil? With your potting soil, yeah. Okay. Did you yep. take that into account when you did your, your total market in, as just growers, or you just took a population? No, that was number of households. Households. Yeah, exactly. What if you don't want it back? Can yeah. you then re <laughs> Great can you question. sell that as a yeah, so product? We'll be, we're, we're currently evaluating building out a platform that you can actually um, donate it to local community organization, organizations that we're going to partner with. So like Cache County um, Community Gardens or Wasatch Community Gardens, where they can actually uh, give that back to their, to their uh, participants. Last question. I think the last question. <laughs> the last question. <laughs> it's set up. Uh, there you go. So how did you come up with your pricing? Because we don't know how much you're shipping back. You don't know how much you're shipping in. How did you come up with your subscription pricing? Yeah, so part of it is uh, monthly expenses. Um, part of it was looking at what other communities are charging. And two, and lastly, or three and lastly, it was really how much, how many customers do we need to hit a certain price point each month so that we can continually stay in business. So um, part of it was all of those three things put together, as well as what people are going to actually pay us to do it. Yeah, thank you. So Anthony says he'll sell the worms, but I went to buy some worms, and he was like, what kind of soil do you have? He wanted to make sure the worms were going to go into a nice home before he would sell it to me. Not really a business guy. He was really focused on the worms' happiness. Okay. And then he never gave me a price. He just walked away. I don't even know. So I'll have to get my worms from somebody else, I guess. Okay. All right. Next. All right. Literally one hour ago, these two didn't know what they'd proclaim as their company name. But now, welcome Starling Co. Welcome, judges, and everyone else. Now imagine this. You're trying to go to a concert or even your kids' soccer game. How do you carry everything? You got your water bottle and your keys and your phone and your wallet. And then you have to carry a blanket for everybody to sit on because kids are going to get cold and it's going to rain at the concert. What if I told you I could solve that problem for you? We're here to introduce the origami blanket. <laughs> Recently, we've surveyed 100 people. Out of those 100 people, 75 of them have been to an outdoor concert or event in the last 12 months. 63% of them taking a big, bulky blanket with them. My name is River McKay, and this is my partner, Anthony Thaxton. We are in the masterminds behind the origami blanket. We are third year Utah State outdoor product design and development students. During this time, we found a huge gap that the market is missing a problem that plagues soccer moms, concert goers, picnickers, and day hikers. How do you carry everything? We're here to show you with the origami blanket. So as you guys can see, we went through a bunch of different iterations, designs, and concepts to come up with essentially the perfect product, the origami blanket. And what makes this product so special and unique is that there is no other product like it on the market. And let me show you why that is. So there's a few key special components about this backpack. It's a blanket as well. Surprise! So in the main body of this blanket, uh, we have our pocket, right? So this holds all the essentials, whether you're going to your kid's soccer game, where you're going to take that special person on a picnic, or even 
wherever you want to go, right? To the campus quad. Um, working our way down to the bottom of the blanket, you see that we have our zippered pocket, as you can see on the bottom right corner. This is ideal for holding all your keys, your phones, your wallets, anything special, anything you want to keep safe, concealed, and you know where it's at. So from the blanket, with just a few simple folds, it takes moments when I have two hands. But I fold it up, and it's held together by three industrial metal snaps. Right? So just a few snaps here, a few snaps there. And actually, where the snaps are placed, it leads the folder kind of during the folding process. So it makes the folding just that much easier to do. So snap, snap, and there we go. We have our blanket again, our backpack. And, <laughs> and on the back, you see we have our shoulder straps. And they're attached with G-hooks for easy on, easy off. Another key feature about our blanket is it's made from linen, which is a natural, sustainably sourced fabric. And the way that we pattern this is for the least amount of fabric waste possible. It's also completely machine washable because we know nobody wants to get grass stains on their blanket. Along with the sustainability, we've looked into our sourcing options. Our overseas production cost on this blanket estimated $8 to $10 per blanket. Our sale price is $39.99 per blanket, leaving us with a 75 to 80% margin. In the future, we would love to expand to one that would have a water-resistant, waterproof backer to come in at a higher price point. Yep. And expanding and creating new products is not our only goal looking forward, right? So with the money that we'd receive from this competition, we plan on putting it towards a patent and with the remaining funds, we plan on investing in prototypes, finding out better solutions and better material to make this product a more high-end, something that everyone's going to want. From there, we'd go onto the Kickstarter platform, get it crowdfunded. And with the money that we would receive from the Kickstarter platform, uh, we would go and reinvest into the business, into the product, and go through marketing, different marketing avenues, and eventually, it will go to Amazon as our main distribution channel. So, thank you all. So, Sharks, who's ready to go to concert with us? <laughs> hold it back up. Yeah. Okay, I am a soccer mom. <laughs> <laughs> businesswoman and soccer mom. My son is actually sitting right here. Soccer is his game. And this is a hassle, what you have between the blanket and the chair and the water bottle and every, like, the kids' phones, everything that you need to come along with that. So it's a great solution. So you guys have done a great job. Thank you. Um, my question is, I don't know how early you are in the stages, but do you have any current sales or have you not, you haven't, you haven't gotten there yet? Not quite. Okay. No. Yeah, so we have a few different prototypes that we've been playing with, and we still have more ideas to improve the product. Um, but we hopefully soon get our first sales. We have gotten a lot of feedback on many people that have wanted this. Okay, so, great. Yes. Great product. Has anyone wanted to buy this yet? Any? Everybody in my marketing class. So <laughs> that's what I like to hear. And so when you spoke with the manufacturing group in China, what's a minimum run for this right here? How, many, how much do you have to spend to get it one run? I have multiple factories. I've worked in sourcing the last couple months in the outdoor industry. So it depends on the factory. One of the factories that I've been looking into, MOQs are about 250, 250 pieces for one run. So, okay. What did you say pricing on for one? Eight to ten dollars, but depending yep. on the factor we choose. Mm -hmm. and what, what was your retail or wholesale price? About thirty nine ninety nine. Retail. Retail. Okay. Yes. Have you considered putting imprinting or uh, we have the, the instructions onto the fabric itself? We have. We actually, today we we're playing around with that in more depth. So we we're planning on laser printing the actual, the actual instructions into the blanket itself. So as you're going through, it would, it would be in a convenient location, ideally on the top corner. So as you're folding the blanket, you can just reference that pattern, that sketched detail and instruction as you're folding it. Okay, so. as you get thicker blankets or if you get the material in the back, is mm -hmm. that going to imp 
impact how the folds work and is it going to become too bulky or? Depending on the material, it could. And so that's why we, so far we're trying to keep it to a, a thinner, more dense, maybe like a, a wool material. So, it's still playing around, but. I've reached out to manufacturers. I've not sent them full details yet. It has to go through their sampling room process, and it just depends on the wait list of their sample rooms. Some are about one month to get first sample, and some are three. So it just depends. And then first run following three to six months after. Sorry. I'm going to ask about branding again. Have you looked into trademarks? Have you looked into... You're, you're talking about some of the money going towards patenting. Have you already talked to somebody about patenting to consider your timeline of what you've shown, what you haven't shown, and any limitations on getting a patent? Exactly. So the reason we, look, we started to look at patents because we think it's a great idea and it's something that we want to hold on to. But we haven't, we're not business students, and we are still reaching out and getting information. Like for you guys, for example, we would love to learn more about the patenting process, how long it would take, and the process that we would need to go down to achieve that. So we're still going down those avenues, but it is a process, so. So very cool product. What, what's the company? Like what would the next phase look like here? I think our next phase, obviously everybody has been asked customer feedback. They want a waterproof one or just expanding out into different avenues, putting a hood on it, making it more versatile, and then moving on to different events and different markets that you could use a two-in-one product for. I like to see Ryan doing the math in his head. <laughs> Hear the gerbil going, it was good. No, we're gonna leave that out here for, we're gonna, for these guys. So, yeah, I'll tell you how new these guys are. They just came up with their name earlier today, and last week when I asked them to do this, River had spent the whole class tearing apart the prototype to make a new prototype, and she said, I just tore it apart. I said, well, good luck. <laughs> so they put that together this week. Uh, I think that's their third or fourth, right? Yeah. All right, so next we have Blue Bowl hot sauce. Here's their little introduction. This sauce is the rage of the school. It makes mouths water and drool. It's been such a hit, my kids even love it. And somehow it made these freshman kids cool. Thank you. First of all, this is Shark Tank, so we're coming and we're asking for any dollar amount in exchange for 0% of our company. A million dollars is preferable. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so I'm gonna say hi. My name is Kimball Goss. And I'm Daryl Merrill. And, and we, we are, are creators, creators of Blue Bull, Bull Rodeo Sauce. So everybody out in the audience, we're gonna ask you to participate, and if you don't, it would screw us over, so please raise your hand. <laughs> Um, how many of you do not like hot sauce because it is too hot or it has a bad flavor? Right. That's exactly, that's exactly it. We believe there's a big market out there for hot sauce that tastes good and has a low amount of heat. Um, really, so, yeah. That's how it works, sorry. <laughs> um, did you guys know that the hot sauce market right now is on fire. <laughs> Sorry, we're almost as bad as punning as uh, the butterflies. <laughs> um, all right, so right now the hot sauce market has been growing and here is a graph um, that shows the future prospects on the hot sauce market. Um, we want to catch this wave and uh, put our little niche in this hot sauce market, and here's how we're going to do it. So we're marketing to a Western audience and an American audience with our hot sauce. A lot of other hot sauces tend to market towards like an Asian or a, a Southern market. Um, some ways we plan on doing this is attending rodeos throughout the summer, especially in Utah, and promoting our sauce at the events and at the food stands there. Um, and another way we're going to do it is by providing free bottles, like most other hot sauce companies, to American-themed restaurants. Think uh, Longhorn Steakhouse, um, Texas Roadhouse, 
Golden Corral and Chakarama, things like that. Um, also, one of the, uh, the other things that differentiates ourselves from other companies, from other hot sauces, um, is we want to uh, make something called, um, uh, we want to have perks for our customers. And they're going to be called herd perks. And what, these, what our customers will do is it will be a subscription base every month, and they will become part of a club. And to these customers, we will have discounts, um, first dibs on new hot sauces, and also on um, the notifications on if a hot sauce is going out, they'll also have dibs on, first dibs on those. Um, and part of the subscription, they will get uh, on our online platform, this money that they are paying will go into an account. And for this account, um, they can buy hot sauces through that subscription. Does that make sense? Like an audible, like, like an audible credit? Yeah. yeah. So their monthly subscription fee is like a credit. Um, just to give you an idea of where we're at right now, to date we've sold about 200 bottles. Just this last Monday, I know, 200 bottles, <laughs> that's impressive. Uh, <laughs> just this last Monday at the farmer's market, we sold 60 bottles in under four hour, hours. And we were also vo voted the favorite company in that competition by the consumers. So thank you guys who, if you went, that was awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, in the future, what we plan to do with the investment, with um, your investment if you decide to invest is we plan to um, build this online platform. We have a website up and running right now, but the total platform is not in place yet, as well as some more research and development and new flavors. We are coming out with some right now that are blueberry and some other flavors, so. Thank you. <laughs> We'd like to hand out some samples if you guys have any questions, so come on up. spill on the table it's yeah. fine don't it's worry right. so can I ask oh, so yeah. at the rodeos when when you're when Thank you're you. out at the rodeos are you are you selling at the rodeos or you're just going to go and try and talk to the the owners of the shops so the first idea we've had about going to the rodeos is when they have an event at the rodeo like the barrel racing or something like that let's say the barrel racing is brought to you by blue bull or something and they bring out a little banner or um, a lot of the rodeos have food stands and so we'd say here, provide, we'll provide you with some bottles, either at free or discounted price, if you'll just encourage your customers to use it. So it's a way to get exposure. Smart. You got your trademark? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the IP guy, come on. That's a good question. <laughs> so you need to, if, if, if everything's based upon the brand, yeah. right, you really need to... Yeah, we own, the, we own bluebullsauce.com. And we are, are working, I think we have a business license, we're, we're working on it, and we're also working on getting into an incubator kitchen to make this in a mass yeah. fashion. Okay, I'm always gonna ask about sales. <laughs> What's the price, what do you sell it for, and then how much does it cost to make a bottle? So, right now, we're selling it at a discounted price of $3 for um, obvious reasons, since we're here at a campus, um, and it's more of a trial than anything else, right? Um, for rodeos and stuff, well, it's a, a more of a bigger market, more adults, so they have a little bit more money, so we'll be selling it for $5. And we make one of these bottles to make cost about $1.40. A dollar forty. So, oh, mm -hmm. okay. Yep, yep, the everything. The packaging, yep. the whole thing. It obviously depends on how much your bulk, how much bulk you're getting in the bottles, how much bulk you're buying the products from, but and that will decrease the more we buy and the bigger we get. Um, right. But for now, that's what we're at. And we'd like to keep it at a low price, especially for college students, because that's a we feel a big drive to it. So, yep. Great, thanks. Anyone else? Did you all try the sauce? Try the sauce. OK, that thanks for not offending me. It was really me. good. Awesome. <laughs> Do you need water? I mean, 
Fraser grew up in Scotland, and uh, there's one Mexican restaurant in Scotland, and so in Edinburgh, we tried to go there. It was like seventy bucks a plate because it's like exotic food. And my wife calls the food bland. Is that just British food or Mexican food? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. The best food in in Great Britain is the Indian food. So, and the fried food. <laughs> It's like living at a state fair. And so there you go. All right. Fake Indian food and fried food. That's Scotland. All right. So we end with one given an earful whose aims may be somewhat uncheerful. With these DNA kits from a mad scientist, doesn't that all seem a bit fearful? Bio experience. Thanks. Okay, yeah, I should get that out of the way that I am a little bit of a mad scientist, so don't freak out. I'm not killing anybody. I'm not doing anything crazy. Um, my company is BioExperience. Uh, hopefully this gets some of your guys' excitement bells running because this is a biotech company that I'm hoping will go big. Um, our goal with BioExperience, I think you need to understand my goals and my vision to be able to understand this company. So hopefully this gets some nostalgia going with some people here. Um, Okay, good, we do have music, maybe. Can you guys hear that? Okay, cool. Well, I'm gonna start it over, maybe. Okay, I gotta start where I'm starting. So, uh, when I was growing up, I was inspired by Jurassic Park. The book, the movie was all about this man, John Hammond. His goal was this look, right here. That look, <laughs> the look of wonder in people's eyes when they saw a dinosaur, when they saw the first time this creature that's been gone forever, an experience with biology. This is me when I was little. I had that same drive. So what I need you guys to realize is I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea to mingle uh, dinosaurs and humans, but I think this is extremely valuable learning by experience, learning by vision, learning by doing. Seeing this spark in people's eyes, seeing the look on people's faces when they start asking questions, okay? This is my dinosaur. I am not able to make a dinosaur yet. But these kits teaching people how to take a normal white bacteria and adding these fluorescent proteins that have been used in cancer treatments, that have been used in medicine, trying to show them that biotech isn't scary, GMOs aren't bad, and that making a dinosaur is actually a really good idea. So, <laughs> what is the problem that I've seen so far? A lot of people, and maybe you'll concur, a lot of people think biology is boring. It's dissecting frogs, it's looking at insects, and it's measuring plant stem lengths and the chlorophyll associated with that. Who's asleep? Um, but making these high quality biotechnology kits and labs are limited by these three things. Lack of infrastructure in these high schools, lack of knowledge by the teachers, and a high cost barrier to being able to get these technologies into the classrooms. So I pitched this idea of trying to change that. I explained the problems and I explained what I'm gonna explain to you to these people. And they liked it. And so they gave us, uh, they, I have to be very careful how I say this because it's not to bio experience, but they allocated $110,000 to me and my team to solve this problem on campus. When we solve this problem, which I'm going to explain how, we will then form and license the IP back to bio experience, which is this company that I'm here to talk about. We make, or we will make, for some reason, this clicker's not working very good. Explorer kits. This explorer kit is this. It's teaching from a white bacteria to um, these colorful proteins. It's trying to teach people these advanced technologies in a very simple way. Our explorer kit is our Hallmark kit. It is $1 to make in consumables in our time. We can sell it at $10 per kit to the consumers and we'll sell it to educators at $50 for a classroom set. We, uh, doesn't take any infrastructure. By switching organisms, switching bacteria, we have solved the problem of infrastructure. You can do it on your table with what we give you. 
They're safe and easy to use. The organism that's in most other people's kits is E. coli, that same thing the CDC just said not to eat your lettuce for. We don't use that because it's not really that safe. The ones that, they, that everyone else uses are still safe, but ours are more safe. Uh, and the best part is you can buy this and keep it on your shelf for 10 years until your one-year-old becomes 11 years old and then use it then. It'll still work, hopefully. <laughs> Once we develop and we license this back from the university, get our company up and running, we'll move through direct-to-consumer sales on, in an online platform. We'll also leverage the connections. This Gear Up program has nine school districts throughout the state and connections in almost every other school district. We're going to saturate the state with our Explorer kits. Beyond that, we'll start building out, uh, with the investment, we will build out our Excite kit, which will be where I can do this really cool science demo in front of all of you, and you'll be amazed but I don't have that yet, otherwise I'd show you. Um, our experience kits will take advanced technologies like CRISPR, if any of you know that word, and it will sh it'll put them in simplified terms so that you can do it at home and learn how the technology works. And then our expert kit is the one I think is gonna have the most IP associated with it. This will be a kit that you can use at the university level and in the industrial level to start your own biotech company. It will have all the tools you need to do a genetic engineering company and start producing products such as medicines and pharmaceuticals. Our competitors tried to solve the problem with um, this company. They tried to solve the problem by making an easy bake oven, but they put it at a price point of $420 a kit, which is way out of the range of any high school. Our other competitor made it a little bit less expensive, $30, but they're still using E. coli and uh, they require you to have your own infrastructure. But this company proves that there's a market for this. Last year they did $500,000 in revenue and he's doing it out of his garage. Um, so, back to my Explorer kit. With us, with the investment, we will form our nonprofit um, and we'll spin off with the university. Purchase any associated IP, trademark all our awesome X's. We'll launch in the 2019-2020 school year leverage those gear up contacts, and then saturate the Utah schools with this kit, and then through online sales, meet the rest of the country. So, thank you, and please invest in bioexperience. <laughs> There's questions. <laughs> yeah, I figured the IP guy would be all over this. <laughs> that, that would work, but I'm a mechanical engineer. Oh, okay, so that's nice. all right. We can still be friends. We got, we got PhDs. I'm getting one too, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you figure out the cost per unit sold? Uh, consumables in time. Okay. And how, how far out are you from the, the finalizing the, the design for the, the kit? Three months. And so you're working with the university, obviously, to, to get your IP. The nice part is we're, being, uh, we're doing everything with open source, Creative Commons stuff. So none of the actual science will be patentable. The only thing that we'll need to license back is any um, copyrights associated with workbooks and materials of how to do the kits that okay. we've developed. So, so any, anything with open source, there's usually an associated license agreement. You've okay. looked through the clauses of the license agreement to verify we'll check what, you're, what you're going to give up, what you're not going to give up. It's usually typically associated with software that the license agreements are problematic, but okay. anything source, open source can be problematic. Okay, we'll check that. Tell me, who is the ultimate consumer here? Is it me, a mom, trying to get my children interested into science? Is it the teacher? What, what, what is, who's, who's your ultimate market? Is a yes answer appropriate there? <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're trying to break into several markets. As I yeah. said, we're targeting consumers and we're targeting educators through different price points. Okay. Our consumers, as we go to events, like you saw those two events that we were pitching at earlier, um, as we go there, parents of five-year-olds are like, I'm buying this for my kid in five more years when they actually know what's going on. And then how many times am I gonna buy it? So if you buy the, Excite, if you buy the Explorer kit, that's a one-time thing. Um, but we will have, as I mentioned, experience kits that will build out several different experiences that you can have, uh, CRISPR, uh, protein enzyme chemistry, etc., uh, that you can then do multiple times, and that's where our focus of R&D will be going forward, is pumping out new experience kits so that people don't get bored. And there's probably a subscription revenue model there. There could be. Yeah. So is it, is it one tray per kit, or is it multiple Petri dishes? The, uh, the discs, right? Oh, right. 
Uh, yeah, just every one? kit will have everything associated with it. But it's just one plus the plus the protein you're going to put into it? For the Explorer kit, uh, yes, it's two plates um, yeah. with the bacteria and all the DNA associated. We're actually not inserting, or we're not inserting proteins, we're changing them at the DNA level. Okay. And so the school version will have, you know, 60 for a right. class exactly. of 30. Right, exactly. And then it looked like there was another uh, lower price point. What's the overall size of the market, do you believe, in this space? I'm not sure on that. It's really hard to get data. Just in Utah, for example, there's 100 high schools. Um, you imagine two to three classrooms per high school that would use this per year. It's 300 classrooms per year per state, and that's just educators. Beyond that, you have junior highs, you have events, you have collegiate users. Just at the university alone, if we became the sole user, there's five or six labs a year that would use these kits in various times. I don't have a, a strong number on that. It's quite difficult to assess. Thank you. Okay. Um, so your competitor yes. that brought in, I think, a half a million in 2018, yes. is that what I saw? Um, how are you getting your price point so much lower than your competitor? Yeah. Um, the, so the way that he does his science is completely, like I said, based on E. coli, uh, which has a different shipping mechanism, it has different growth requirements. Um, I think he also includes, um, he's got a different focus on being able to then, I don't want to say the word reproduce, but his kits are not single use. His kits, like you can use experiment up to five times, so it gets his uh, cost per experiment down to $6, for example. Um, but really, you only ever do the experiment once unless you have five people doing it at the same time. So by trying not to waste, I can reduce. But by changing the organism, I change the whole game, in, especially in manufacturing on my end, to reduce the cost. Okay, that's great. Thank you. I honestly think it's a little unfair to use Jurassic Park theme music, so <laughs> if you didn't feel your heart soaring or feel a little tearful, you're a sociopath, so. <laughs> so. All right, so the four of you, I want you to, where's Daniel? Is he back there? Oh, there he is. Daniel's going to take you back. You guys figure this out, okay? Figure this out be, be, between the, the four of you. Don't get in any fights, um, and then we're going to... We're going to show a short little video right now. Um, uh, actually, we're going to throw the airplane. So put your airplanes together while we're doing the video, and then we'll show the video, and then you throw them at me, and we'll kind of figure it out from there. Does that work? OK. Wait, what? Oh, if you came, you must have come late. Did you come late? This, OK. So this is your pitch. We're going to let everyone pitch an idea, OK? You're going to have a practice doing this. So you're going to put the idea on the paper. You're going to make an airplane. And then I'm going to stand right here. You're going to try and hit me, OK? First four to hit me get to pitch. Or if you don't hit me, it's the closest ones. And we have Chick-fil-A cars, uh, gift certificates, just because you did that. So all right. Does that make sense? Any questions? Do you have any questions, Mr. Red Tie? No questions for him? OK, great. All right, we're going to watch a little video on Seed, if they can get it up here. What's that? Oh, you are? All right, we're, gonna, we're stalling a little bit right now. No, we're going to have you throw this up. Now, while we're doing this, I want to talk about the minor in entrepreneurship, OK? So if you are here or anywhere over the summer and you're going to be in school, you need to do the minor in entrepreneurship. Four classes, 12 credits, you can do it all online, OK? There are no requirements. So if you're a, a freshman like these two, Daryl and Kimball, or if you're all the way to your senior year and you still haven't declared a major, you can still get into this program. If you want to do what these guys have done, get into the minor for entrepreneurship. Because in this class, we're not focused on tests and papers. We're focused on trying to help you start your business in school. 
you've got a little idea, a little hustle on the side, come and work on it for class and get a grade on it, okay? So that's what we want you to do. So today we open summer enrollment for the minor in entrepreneurship. If we can if we get this class filled up, we can open another section, get more and more people in this class, okay? So let's get in there as quick as possible. Let's get into the minor in entrepreneurship. Your classes are MSLE 3510, 3530, 40, and 80. They're all called New Venture Something. And if you take marketing, you get to have me as a teacher, and so that's pretty cool, okay? All right. Um, I think that's it. Oh, also, we have the fall. It's going to be online broadcast and in class. That will open next week as well. So if you're going to not take classes over the summer, sign up for the fall for the minor in entrepreneurship. Okay, you're going to take your chance now. See, so you can hit me. Let's do. Oh, do you guys put your name on it? If you haven't put your name on it, then I won't know who it came from. We'll just have this guy in the red tie saying it was my idea again. And and so, okay, ready? If you got your name on, it, you go. Oh, that was so bad. <laughs> there's one. Okay, let's get... Oh, there's one. That was a ball. <laughs> okay, I'm going to look at that one. Okay, one more. Let's get... This is like... I'm like Samuel the Lamanite. Oh, okay, we're done. <laughs> I'll take... Okay, it was the ball and that ball. All right, here we go. Sorry for that Samuel the Lamanite reference. If you don't know what it is, ask your neighbor. Okay. All right. Let's see what we've got here. Okay, Rachel Bird. Bluetooth pings? Come on up, Rachel Bird. Rachel, where are you? You just threw it at me and hit me, okay. <laughs> are you a softball player? <laughs> yeah, she nailed me. All right, our next one is Jeff Ryan with an organizer for liquid medicine. Jeff, come on up. I think that's the one I caught. All right, Garrett, who, his last name is a mess. Garrett Krogong. Looks like Krog Magnum. Houses and buildings, something for houses, wireless power like Wi Fi. Okay, come up here, Garrett. Messy last name. Okay. All right, and last. This is just this is trash. <laughs> All right, where's that other one I had over there? It's right over there. There's nothing on this one. Someone just wanted to. Was that you? Was that my son? Was that you? <laughs> I think this one was the next closest. I dropped it when I picked up this. Okay, the next one is. Did you guys just do this again? Okay, I didn't say just hit me with a pair <laughs> All right, I think our next closest is this one. All right, we got something here. All right, Sean Walton, come up here. Sean Walton. A chip inside the steering wheel. Okay, we'll let you talk about it. All right, let's go, softball player. So just explain it a little bit. One minute, right? One minute? Yep. One minute. Let's oh, go away. it's not going to take that long. So um, my husband and I just moved into a basement apartment. It's a little old, a little outdated. And there's like one plug in each room, and it's on like the weirdest wall. And so we were like, I wish there was a way to be able to plug everything we need in and not have to have like extension cords running around the ceiling and all the things like that. And so we wish there was a way to do Bluetooth power, like Bluetooth plugs, kind of like you do with Alexa devices or things like that, so that we would be able to plug in something on that weird random side of the wall and be able to have it charge our laptop or our printer or speaker or something like that. So we wish that there was a Bluetooth plug that we could use in older homes like that that aren't equipped for the new technology we have. So mine is just an idea. It's something that we had to pitch in Dr. Glauser's class. Um, I have a four-year-old son who has a heart condition. Um, he actually just got it fixed over Christmas break, so it's all good. Um, thank you. Um, but his, his heart beats too fast, and he had liquid medicine every day for his first four years of life. And one day, me and my wife both dosed him when we weren't supposed to. So we double-dosed him. 
and we realized that there was no, he was fine, but we realized there was no way um, to track the medicine. We would go get a syringe, take it out of the bottle every night, give it to him, but for little pills, they have little organizers, but I could never find anything for that for liquids. So it's just a simple Sunday through Saturday organizer that you can have your liquids in it, so you can take it, so you don't have to take your whole bottle with you, which is $300, so if you spill it, it's a bad day. So it's just an organizer for liquid medicine. So my idea, excuse me for my sore throat, um, is actually similar, it's like basically the exact same idea as yours, is uh, to have basically power like a Wi-Fi signal basically to your phone, smartphone, computers, laptops, basically anything that goes into a plug. Um, it would be connected through a battery and it would just basically charge the battery, which then you can you know, take outside and bring it back in and it will automatically connect to like the Wi-Fi, but connect to the source of power. They already have wireless charging. You set your phone on the little pad. Why can't it just be, you know, the pad be up there and your phone's charging down here? So my idea is to limit the fatalities and death of texting and driving by embedding a chip within steering wheels of cars that would disable texting and messaging apps. All right, so we're gonna cheer to see who's got the best idea. The best idea gets a sweater. You get to pick the size, I just grabbed a sweater. You also get sweaters if we have them too, but you guys, whoever loses has to help pick up this mess. So. All right, so Bluetooth plugs, is that what you're saying? Yeah, right here. Okay, so we got a huge cheer right there. Okay. Medicine organizer. All right, why don't you guys just, just pick it up? Okay, that's it. Just just pick it up. You guys are <laughs> you, you gotta go help too. <laughs> so you, you guys go get a sweater. You guys can get a sweater as well. Okay. All right, just put it right here. All right, now we're going to pass on two minutes to two to four minutes for Mike Glauser. You've probably guessed by now that at the Center for Entrepreneurship, we absolutely love what we do. We, we uh, tell our partners we're not going to work, we're going to the playground each day, and we have a, a lot of fun. We would love to help you learn the skills of entrepreneurship. You can use them in your own startup company, or you can use them in any organization that you work for. Let's keep the shirts coming, Andy. Um, so, as you know, this class is a pass-fail class, and you have to do something to get your grade. So tonight, you still have a form you have to fill out, and you can just put things that you've learned from watching these pitches. Anything that you learned from watching these pitches that you might be able to use, put those on the form and turn, turn them in so you'll get credit for the final class. And then most of you know there is one simple final paper. Do It's due a week from today. It's a reflection paper. It's three to four pages, uh, double-spaced with a 12-point font, and you're going to just write some things that you learned that you think are really valuable to your career, okay? So it's kind of like what we've done at the start of each of these lectures, but you have to turn that final paper in to get your final grade, all right? So I will send you an email reminder on Friday. I'll send you another one on Monday. But you need to submit something by Wednesday, and then we'll give you a passing grade for the class, all right? Um, one of the things I like to do when we do market research is simply ask people if they would buy a product. I want to ask you here tonight while we're waiting for the judges to uh, fill out these big checks. Um, how many of you would buy the butterflies for a party birthday party or a wedding or something. Raise your hand if you would buy that product. Okay, that's awesome. Almost every hand is up here. How many of you would use the compost service? Okay, more hands go up. Excellent, excellent. How about, how many of you would buy the origami blanket? Okay, that seems to be the favorite. Um, how many want to try the Blue Bowl rodeo sauce? <laughs> you got to step up your production, you guys. Okay? I would buy one as well. And the Explorer DNA kit, if you understood it, 
would you have liked to use one of these in high school? Okay, okay. So these are uh, viable business opportunities that could be turned into real companies if these students have the passion and the perseverance to stay with it and continue to pivot until it actually works. So our judges are almost finished. I think we have one short video we want to show. Is that right, Russell? Yeah, so they're coming out. They're coming out. Oh, they're done? Oh, they're almost done. They're almost done, so we're going to want to show the video? Yeah, we'll show the video. All right, we've got a video. Then, Amberly, you're going to come up and talk about it, right? Okay, great. In Cash Valley, or Compost Cash Valley, we will recycle all this paper. Don't worry. Can we get the sound on? Oh, it's on the keyboard. Okay. It is in multiple different cities in Peru that are really addressing human trafficking and how to keep children safe. One of the things that we've partnered with is in Lima, and we have two interns that are from the U.S. that are currently walking alongside one of the aftercare homes. My name is Andy Tunnell, and I'm the program coordinator of the Entrepreneurship Center in the Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. We just paired up recently with Operation Underground Railroad, and we're piloting a program in an aftercare facility there. We have, we have two interns that are working with individuals at that aftercare facility. It's a vocational school. They're able to go there and teach these business skills that they've been able to uh, learn in the classroom. The girls are learning entrepreneurship in order to start their own business. Why is this so important? Because we're creating livable incomes. We want them to be able to feel empowered so that they know how to have an income after they leave the aftercare home. The survivors of human trafficking that are in, the, in these aftercare facilities, a lot of them don't have self-confidence. You know, they come from a past where, I mean, incredible situations that they've had to live through, just things we can't even imagine. And when they're, when they're saved out of that, it's, it's hard for them to realize that they're capable of doing great things. And so mentorship is a key aspect of this program, being able to place students that can help mentor them and help them believe in themselves and you know, help, help them progress along the way in order, in order to, to be successful is, is a really important aspect of the internship. The vocational training that happens inside the aftercare homes is incredible. There's a frog farm in Thailand. There's a sewing project in India, and there is a welding center inside the aftercare home here in Peru. These are all different examples, and there's so many more of the different things that happen inside the aftercare homes, and the things that are so vital is that they have something that they are passionate about. Soy Francesca. Yo tengo siete meses participando aquí en la casa, Santa María. Eh, lo que me motiva es, bueno, salir adelante, a aprender más, o sea, lo que me gusta, peinar, eh, pintar el cabello, hacer las uñas. Mi sueño mayor sería, eh, bueno, no, recibir mi cartón y tener mi salón. Y también mm, agradecerle a Dios por haberme puesto estas personas a esta casa y estas personas son buenas. Yo pienso que lo que hace diferente a Operation Underground de otras organizaciones es esta posibilidad que tiene de involucrarse más allá de un tema funcional o de un apoyo netamente en recursos materiales. Hay un desprendimiento y un apoyo, una voluntad de ayudar en todo sentido, como una familia. En realidad, son como una familia que ayudan a sus hermanos, en este caso a nosotros como país, a que podamos de alguna manera erradicar y neutralizar esta problemática y esta lacra que es la trata de personas en nuestro país y la explotación de niños especialmente. Thank you so much for standing with us in Aftercare. Thank you for all of the donations that you've given and the support and the thoughts and the prayers. There are so many survivors and their hearts say thank you. Their mouths, their minds, they all say thank you. Thank you to our audience. Thank you for supporting us. And from my heart, thank you so much for supporting the aftercare of survivors of human trafficking.
just so you all know, tomorrow there is a screening of um, Operation Underground Railroad's new uh, movie about their most recent operation, uh, their sting operation, Operation Toussaint. Um, the, we'll have a little social before that starts at 7. Uh, the movie itself starts at 8 in the ballroom here, Eccles Business Building Auditorium. Um, so come to that. It'll be amazing. OUR does some awesome stuff. Um, but I am just going to briefly tell you about the SEED program. That is uh, what those two interns were on in Peru is the SEED program. It's a three-month international internship open to all majors, and the best part is that you don't pay for it. Um, it's you go and you teach just basic, basic business principles to aspiring entrepreneurs or, you know, these women that are in aftercare. You can go to Ghana, the Philippines, Peru, or the Dominican Republic. It's an incredible opportunity. You get a stipend that covers your airfare and your housing. The most you'll pay is a couple hundred dollars, you know, for your food. Um, these countries are really cheap to live in. and. It's totally different than just traveling to a place. Getting to live there, getting to know these people, and actively making a difference is something that I think we all should strive to want to do if we don't already. Um, this is, it is a semester long thing. It happens every semester. Right now we're taking applications for next spring. You apply about a year in advance because uh, you take a one credit class the semester before that gets you ready to go. You meet the other interns you're going with, but it's absolutely worth it. Uh, applications are due April 14th. That's in, what, 11 days, so get on it. It's not a hard application at all. We'd love to see as many of you apply as possible. Again, it's open to all majors, and don't be afraid about, you know, a $5,000 study abroad that lasts two weeks. This is something that is absolutely accessible to everyone. And I think we're about ready for, we're about ready to hear our winners for tonight. designed this so this is if you want to hire me for design skills this is I didn't draw the picture I just put it up there and put the words on top it's really simple so high quality all right are you gonna present Ryan you're looking pretty good today you could be our presenter today are these in order they are in order all right All right, are we gonna take pictures? You got pictures? So I've gotta do the whole shake and everything. Do you want somebody else up here? Where's Marissa? Oh, Amber Lee's up here. Okay, great. All right, so we have money for everyone, looks like. Actually, everyone was just that good. Everyone was that good. Let's give a round of applause to all these student entrepreneurs. Seriously, it's really cool what you guys have done. All right, let's start with, we have two awards for $500. Compost, Cash Valley, and Bio Experience. Come on up. Come, come look all pretty here in a picture. You just wait for them. Just wait for them. They're going to take a picture first. All right. Congratulations, Compost Cash Valley. All right. Bio Experience. Congratulations. All right. Let's get a picture. You got to take a picture first, AJ. All right. Do you, you, Rachel's like paparazzi right there. What is a... What is a Popper, a single paparazzi? Paparazzo, right? It's masculine. I don't know why. All right. Okay. So our next one, two awards for $1,000 is Starling Co. and Blue Bowl Sauce. Come on up. All right. 
Look pretty there for Rachel. Nicely done, Rachel. All right, let's shake some hands. All right, you guys, head on up. All right, go shake those hands. And then the company that everyone says butterflies, and then they go, oh, that's something. River Bottom Butterflies, come on up for $2,000. There they are. Like two painted ladies coming down. Or monarchs. Monarchs, sorry. All right. Look at those brothers. Okay. <laughs> All right. Is that it? Anything else? All right. Everyone, thank you for an incredible semester. I see some sprinting for ice cream. Go get your ice cream. But thank you again. And take this class again next year. <laughs>